All right, good morning. My name is Jimmy. Uh, I've been away for a little bit. I'm so glad, so glad to be back. Um, and I want to say one, very quickly, one quick shout out to the Ohanians, to John, for shouldering so much of the burden uh, while I was out. So thank you, Ohanians, and especially John. Uh, we are gathered here today to worship. Uh, you probably are aware, but if you're not, um, Pastor Waters is on vacation. So we have a guest preacher today, Michael Gambola. I will uh, introduce Michael in a little bit. Um, but we are gathered to be reminded of what's true, right? Um, to have our hope, um, to, to, to renew our hope, to have our hope fixed on the rescuer, right? On Jesus. Um, and so it feels a little strange maybe to do this uh, on a Saturday morning uh, or from home. Uh, but I would encourage you to take a couple minutes, quiet your heart. And be reminded, we're going to sing uh, that the Lord is our health, our life, and our salvation. He is our life and our salvation. Uh, there's a lot of other places we've sought life and salvation this week. So take a moment, quiet your heart. Um, I'm going to read Psalm 103, uh, that God's call to worship. I invite you to go ahead and stand. And then we're going to sing praise to the Lord the Almighty. This is God's call to us to worship Him out of His Word. Psalm 103 says this, The Lord has established His throne in the heavens, and His kingdom rules over all. Praise the Lord, all His works, in all places of His dominion. Praise the Lord, O my soul. Let's do that.
and what you have for us today, that we would go out from here and serve you, that we would take up our cross and follow you, Lord Jesus. Help us to worship you in spirit and in truth now. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Let's sing before the throne of God above. <laughs> Sits enthroned, he looks out 
on all the inhabitants of the earth. He who fashions the heart of them all and observes all their deeds. The king is not saved by his great army. A warrior is not delivered by his great strength. The war horse is a false hope for salvation. And by its great might, it cannot rescue. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his steadfast love, that he may deliver their soul from death and keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield, for our heart is glad in him. Because we trust in his holy name, let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us, even as we hope in you. This is God's word. It's easy to hear it and just let it bounce off, at least bounce off my ears. Let me ask you a couple questions this morning as you think about your last week. We read, the king is not saved by his great army. A warrior is not delivered by his great strength. The war horse is a false hope. Many of us are probably not hoping in war horses or armies or even our strength. But there's something like that that you hoped in this week, right? And there's something that all of us turn to instead of the Lord. And if you say, no, Jimmy, those three verses don't actually apply to me, then I'd ask you this question. Look at verses 6 through maybe even 9. The word of the Lord, the heavens were, for by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, right? For he spoke and it came to be. What did your words do this week? Right? How did you use your words? Uh, were they for building? Were they for the justice that we read about that the Lord loves? Did they create or did they tear down? Did they destroy? Did they gossip? Did they covet? I mean, it's not hard to read a couple of these verses and come kind of to an end of ourselves and realize, yes, verse 18 and 19, uh, our, our hope is in the Lord, the one who delivers the soul from death. And so we're going to collectively now read our confession of sin and need of Christ and then hear Jesus, the Son of the One, uh, who created all things, who spoke that word and created all things, declaring your forgiveness. So uh, turn to your bulletin, read with me now. O God of all grace, we confess that we are sinners, but in Christ Jesus, you have given us a Savior. Make him our greatest desire, our hope, our only boast. Preserve us by his grace from this present evil world so that its smiles may never allure us, and its frowns may never terrify us. Cause us to live as strangers and pilgrims, knowing that our true citizenship is in the city of heaven, so that all we do may be done to our Savior's glory, in whose name we pray. Amen. Hear the words of that Savior. Jesus said to them, in essence to you, all that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. Let's respond with singing, with loud shouts. Let's sing with us. His mercy is more. Let us all stand and sing. Stronger than darkness, new every morning. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Thank you. 
Nothing like a good humbling. Play the strings skillfully, right? Uh, we come to a time of, uh, of congregational prayer. Uh, what I'll say is typically, you know, when we're recording this, I just pray for you guys, and I'm going to do that. Um, if you need prayer, right, please talk to me, talk to Sarah, talk to John. We want to pray for you. If there's something going on, you don't want to share it right now or, or publicly, um, we get that. There's a lot of things that, that I have going on. Um, but please let us be praying for you as, as elders, as leaders, uh, as brothers and sisters. But let's go before the Lord. And let's, let's pray to Him now. God, you're a king. You're sovereign over all things. You're a creator of all things. Um, Lord, I think I, I at least confess for myself, I quickly dismiss the glory and the grandeur of you as creator. Again, that by your breath, your mere words, that you spoke into creation and existence, all things, and that by my breath can fog a window or hurt someone. And I'm, I'm finite of dust, uh, but you are eternal, everlasting, glorious, great, good. And so, Lord, we come to you uh, humbly and, and boldly. God, we come humbly knowing that we are so unlike you and, and, and frail and weak and you are strong and mighty. Uh, we come boldly knowing that you have called us to come. You have made a way. And all these pictures in the Old Testament of a, a curtain torn down is to show us uh, that we have direct access uh, to you. Supreme God, that we have permission, that we are even encouraged to call you Father, and to come and bring uh, our hearts to you, and our, and our petitions, and our thanksgivings. And so Lord, I pray that this time would not just be another filler for the service, but would be a, a time of reflection in our own hearts. Um, I, I feel the call to repentance even as I neglect prayer, God. So forgive me. Please change my heart. Uh, Lord, shape providence, your people, into a people that delights and runs to you in prayer. That is, uh, thankfulness is always on our lips. That we do not fear, that we are not anxious, because we are always bringing uh, our concerns and our fears to you, to your throne. And so, God, this morning I lift up those who are sick, those who are, those who are uh, home and, and bodies are not are falling apart, breaking down. Um, Lord, I pray that you would offer them comfort. I pray that you would um, surround them with uh, folks, doctors, and um, folks that can help them, that can offer them um, aid. And, and I pray that you restore bodies and um, Lord, where heads hurt, I pray that heads would not hurt anymore, that headaches would go away. God, Lord, those who are whose eyesight is failing, or uh, just body aches and pains, uh, Lord, would you grant some relief, some peace? Uh, would you give doctors wisdom as they're diagnosing? Uh, and Lord, uh, for our folks who are sick and struggling, would you give them hope? Um, Lord, it is easy for me to say a few words up here. It is hard to grind out day after day uh, in constant pain. And so, God, I pray that there would be true life in knowing that mercies are new each day. Um, that wouldn't be a platitude, but that would be a well um, that we could, that our, that our people, that your people could drink deeply of. And I pray for those who feel alone and isolated in this bizarre time of uh, the society opening, maybe not opening, uncertainty, um, how close, how many people, it's, it's confusing, it's, um, it's, it's hard, God. the days are hard in some ways, and so I pray that you would... Um, Give us eyes to see and capacity to move towards those who, um, those that, that you put in our lives, those around us, whether we know they're struggling or not, whether we think they are or not. God, give us feet to move swiftly towards those um, that you've put into our world to engage them, to encourage them, to spur them on, um, to point them back to you. And God, use those people, open our ears when those people are placed in our lives uh, to hear your words encouraging our own hearts. Um, 
God, this world's broken, um, and we're seeing that now. And uh, we find ourselves angry and hurting and confused. And um, and again, it's 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 a difficult time. And um, Lord, I thank you that at least we know this much that that you and Jesus have been the victim of unjust accusations, that you were the one broken, that you were the one that was unjustly accused and murdered, that you were the one that emptied yourself, that took the punishment, that was spit on and hated and rejected, um, that was forsaken, abandoned, um, that had all the power and yet gave it all up um, out of love for us. Uh, and so God, there is, at least in my own heart, so much uncertainty and and uh, maybe even anxiety. But God, let uh, calm my heart, calm our hearts. Lead us beside the still waters, right in the green pasture of seeing the cross and knowing you're in control, you're good. God, give us those two truths. Let us cling to those uh, those two truths this week, and as we work out the details, let us do so with fear and trembling, knowing again you are in control and you are good. Gotta pray for the waters and pray that you give them rest uh, and keep them safe as they're coming home. Thanks for some time away for Brian. Thank you for uh, Michael being here to preach. And God, I pray that we would hear uh, this morning that you would prepare our hearts to hear and be encouraged um, by your word. Uh, and I pray that you would speak boldly and uh, truthfully through Michael. And, uh, Lord, shape our hearts to be more like Christ and then uh, send us out into this world, into this week. More like Jesus, and God, give us hearts to, to gather your sheep, to go to our neighbors and our friends and our coworkers, and uh, draw alongside them with the good news uh, of Jesus. God, I pray for other churches who are gathering, and that you would uh, be with them. I pray for leaders, too, uh, that they would have wisdom as they sort out how uh, meetings are going to look. Uh, moving forward, continue to uh, give them grace and uh, wisdom. And God, too, again, I pray for the leaders of our, of our state, of our, um, of our towns, and our state, and our, and our country, God. Um, you love justice and righteousness. We, we read it this morning. God, work justice and righteousness through the leaders that, that you've called to their positions now. Um, Lord, uh, I pray that you would, again, assure us by the truth of your word, that the good work that you have started in us, you will bring to completion. And I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We are going to stand and sing the doxology. Sing with me. Praise God from whom all blessings flow.
Thanks, Jimmy. It is uh, good to be with you all. Uh, I'll say a quick word of thanks um, about the Counseling Center, and then we'll, we'll dive right into to the Word. And I won't be, uh, it'll, it'll look like I'm staring and talking mostly to the Clintons today, but I'm just looking at the camera, so I'll, I'll, uh, I'll also acknowledge the fact that the rest of you are actually here. So. Um, but yeah, I just want to say a th brief thank you. This is, a, I guess, year three of sharing office space with Providence, and uh, you all have been great neighbors, even better friends. And it's, it's just been a wonderful partnership for, for me personally and also for the organization. Uh, in, in lots of ways, I'll just mention a couple. Uh, we've included some of you all uh, in, in, in the hiring process. We've invited different people in uh, to candidate with us at different times when we've hired counselors. But we've also gotten just great feedback. Uh, it's, it's been invaluable to help us to grow as a ministry. Uh, we we want to be a place that is accountable to the churches we actually serve. And so you all have been a part of that too, so thank you. And um, that's, uh, yeah, that's, so, yeah, that's, that's all. all I'll say about counseling. And, um, we're, we're here to do something else. So let, why, don't you, why don't you pray with me and we'll talk about these, these verses together. Our Father, we are grateful for your, your kindness to care for us through your word and, and through your creation, though it's fallen and it feels uh, often that it is against us, our bodies even fail us. Uh, but Lord, would you sustain us through your words? You say in the prophets, you've given him the word, uh, the the words to sustain, um, the gift to sustain one who is weary, uh, sustain with the word one who is weary. And so I pray that these words would be ones that sustain and that encourage and that, and that lead us forward in, in, in your calling for each one of us in Jesus' name. So uh, the last two times uh, I shared with you all a sermon. We was here worshiping with you all. Of it. I think it was goodness, it was months ago now. But I spent one time talking about God's perspective on our past and how He's, he's strong to be able to cover over past experiences of shame and of sin. And then uh, the next one we talked about God's perspective on our present. And said that many of us are basically preoccupied with things from the past or fearful of things in the future. And that God wants to meet us here in the here and now with His, with his comfort, His presence. And uh, so today we'll have a little bit of a future perspective. And what, what is it that we are aiming toward? What, what, what do we aspire to for the future? And that's going to be the angle that we talk about. Um, and the reason I think this is valuable is that I think that we're in a time where a lot of us are having to take stock of our lives. And of course, some of us look back kind of pre-quarantine and we miss things about our lives. Uh, but there are other things that we don't miss, and I've been hearing this from a lot of people, that they, they realize, wow, I, I had stocked every single weekend and every single night with stuff. I was either carpooling kids or I was running back and forth between all kinds of things. And now that I can't go most places that I used to go, or at least for a season, I was almost, you know, some people were almost entirely homebound, and some of us are still working from home. Um, but it, it gives a lot of people space to think, like, what a... What do I actually want my life to be? What what? How do I want the life to be set? My life to be set up and arranged. Um, you know, it, it's maybe unique in, in our whole lifetimes that we get almost distance from how we would live if we were free to live, the pace and just the structure that we had. And I think there are a lot of reasons why, or at least many people I talk to, they look back and they say, "I was running so hard." Uh, why, why was I? Why was I running so? Why were we going so hard? Why do we never take a break um, and, and experience some quietness? And when I think about that, I think of the you know the preoccupations that all of us carry. You know, our, our work demands a lot from us. If you're in school, school demands a lot from you. If you're if you're spending most of your time doing caregiving, family requires a lot of you, and all that's appropriate. But it also creates these. It fosters these fears that. It, it encourages us, nudges us towards certain preoccupations, doesn't it? Because if you know we're worried, is my career progressing the way that I, I would like it to? Is my job in danger? Um, you know, how are we going to make it? Are we going to make it financially? How are we going to ever? Will we ever get out of debt? Uh, if you're a parent, you're thinking, Am I, my kid's going to turn out okay? Uh, is all this effort that I'm throwing into them? What's it all going to? What's it all going to lead to? Uh, some of us as well are wondering, you know, will we ever be able to retire with a measure of dignity? 
Now, these are real pressures. Not a single thing that I, I mentioned is something that's like, that you would say, oh, why are you worried about that? It, it's all valid concern. And I think um, it, that those kinds of those kinds of pressures, those kinds of possibilities that we think about for the future, uh, really generate a lot of unrest and motivation to to be energetically involved in a lot of the things that we're doing, and even to be harried in what we're doing. We have these aspirations, we have goals, but here's the here's the kicker, right? Was we almost every single goal that we would set for ourselves, it's uncertain that we would uncertain. Uh, it's not a it's not an open shut case that we'd be able to achieve it for ourselves. We don't know how children will turn out. We don't know how work career will will go. We save, but we don't know what the stock market will do. We all we live in the midst of uncertainties, and then and then all of a sudden everything grinds to a halt, and we're stuck at home for a few months or for a period of time. And although it has quieted a lot of things, I I know that that very few of us experience any long inter uninterrupted period of inner or inner quietness or peace. Um, although a lot of the economy has shut down, a lot of stuff in us has not shut down, right? For many of us, the unrest is still there, and maybe it's unrest that even your friends or your family members don't even, wouldn't even know looking at you. you. You seem to keep it all together on the outside. Uh, but of course, you know, when you look, you look out the window, you look through the screen at the, at the news, the unrest is there too, right? In our communities, our state, our country. A lot of the unrest is just right out there in the open, visible. And the reason I flag both that inside and outside unrest is that, that the passage that we're talking about today is very much directed right at that kind of unrest. Uh, the letter to the Thessalonians that, that, that Jimmy read for us, in there we get the idea that, that there are these disruptions in the life of the church. There are sins and problems of, of all kinds. There are problems in their political life. The Christians in the city, they sense that there's, there's this trouble on the, uh, on the horizon. They fear for their futures. And into this situation, Paul writes to them, and he gives them several words of, of advice or wisdom to navigate. But the one I want us to look at most carefully is verse 12, where it, it, it tells us what we are to aspire to, what we are to set our ambitions on, what we are to, to aim for for the future. And, and uh, here's what I want you to hear. There are places in life, in your life, where things are noisy and, and there's disquiet. There's unrest. But I want you to hear that you have a Heavenly Father who is good. And, and He sees it. He loves you. And He does want to give you rest. He invites you to rework your, your ambitions, what you're aiming toward, in light of this rest, the rest that is to come, but also the rest that He gives us here and now. And so I want you to hear in his, his voice, this, this kind Father's voice, um, for our, from the Lord our God, through these, these words in the Apostle Paul, to aim for a quiet life. And we're going to talk about that in two ways. One is a quiet life in how we love, and the other is a quiet life in how we work. We'll spend most of the time on that first one. Um, and uh, so we'll, we'll jump right in. Verse 9, ESV, that, that Jimmy read it again, is, it says, Now concerning brotherly love, and what that, see, what, what that probably means is, now that thing that we were writing, now that thing that you wrote to us about, uh, brotherly love, it kind of suggests that the people had written to Paul and said, um, can you help us, Paul? We're, we're, we're trying to love each other and we're running into some troubles. Uh, that seems to be the way Paul kind of uh, nods at, at a question that they have sent to him. And so then Paul's to answer it. But right at the outset, I wonder if it surprises you that people who are facing political unrest, you know, of a magnitude far more than what, what we deal with, the relative uncertainties that we deal with politically, we have a relatively stable life, right? Um, at least for, for many of us, many of the communities directly around us here. Um, and yet, this is a, this is a place that, that faced significant political unrest and uncertainty and physical danger. But what they write to Paul to ask about is to say, can you help us learn to love each other? And I wonder if you can imagine being burdened by that amid whatever unrest that you're dealing with. Uh, of course, we are, I mentioned that we have a measure of stability, but we're dealing with relative political uncertainty, racial tensions, of course, uh, uh, a highly contagious virus, uh, economic instability that is connected to that for, for some people is not connected to that for others. There are, there are troubles that predated this, right? But what if, 
us, what if we, looking out at all those troubles, that unrest outside of us, the unrest inside of us, and said, Paul, can you tell us what we're really concerned about is how, how can we find a way to love each other in all of this? People in this room, um, can you help, can, Paul, can you help us learn to love each other? People who I experience as enemies, can you help us to understand, help us to learn how to love even then? They're asking, Paul, can you help us with brotherly love? And the early church did something really interesting when they, when they talked in terms of brotherly love or family love, uh, which uh, brother and sister, verse 10, or family love also in verse 10. Uh, br uh, before Christians started doing this, uh, we, we don't really see in the Greek language these kind of words referring to anyone other than blood relatives. They just didn't, they just didn't call people a brother or sister in that language unless you actually were their brother or sister. But the word back in verse 9, and you've heard it before, it's Philadelphia, brotherly love. It's applied to fellow church members and not blood relatives. And it's a little bit like what Jesus said, isn't it? Uh, who is my mother and brother or sister? It's the one who does the will of God. That there, there's something that's thicker than blood here. That uh, those, who, those who are united with us, in, in a, even in our church family, even Providence, there's something that connects you more deeply than what connects you in, um, in, in your own family. And I wonder what that would look like if we actually believe that. Because the reality is it's, that's, a, that, that's reaching, right? That's an ideal that you reach for. But you know, at the end of the day, the only person you try to feed is your own kid, right? Uh, you know, in your own house. Uh, but that's actually not how it should be in the church, right? Is if someone needed food, you, you, would, you would serve them, right? Because you do view them as your own flesh and blood. But think about it. I'll, I'll give one example. That, and, I, and I'm going to highlight a group of people who, uh, who think about this question I know a lot because I listen to them so much and hear so much about it. And it's the people who are, are walking, uh, walking with the Lord and, and who are not married, who are single. And um, some of them have told me and shared with me specific fears about their futures. Now, some of them I know want to be, you know, some of these friends I'm referring to, uh, want to be married, uh, but for whatever reason don't anticipate getting married. So for some of them, they've actually never experienced attraction to the opposite sex. For others, uh, they were married, but unexpectedly found themselves single again. Uh, for still others, there are other reasons why they just they don't, they don't necessarily see that in their horizon, or, or maybe they long for it in their horizon, they don't see it coming. But, some of the, but these different friends, from all, the, the, their, all their life stories are a little bit different. I hear the same kinds of fears, and they, they tend to sound like this. What's going to happen on holidays? Am I just going to sometimes just be alone? Um, what's going to happen on evenings and weekends? Am I going to spend those alone? Major life events, do I walk through those alone too? What if I get sick or hurt? And then the kicker, the, the real big one sometimes is, you know, when I die, will I die alone? Those are some of the big ones, but sometimes it's not just the big ones. The, sometimes it's the small stuff. Who, who's, will there be anyone to give me a ride to the doctors uh, if I can't, you know, can't get myself there and back? What, and I'm guessing no one's, no one will drop off chicken soup if I'm if I'm sick. Uh, is that is that something I I just that's not that's a maybe a small thing, but it seems meaningful. But I wonder if we could be churches. I wonder if we could be people that answer those questions. That, that say, no, no, don't be ridiculous, you're coming to our house on Thanksgiving. Or, I'm so sorry to hear you're sick. I, stop, stop what you're saying, I'm coming over right now with some cough drops and tea. But I even know some people who have gone a step further than that and said, I know that you're afraid of what this end of life thing is going to look like. I know you're thinking that far ahead. And I want you to know that if you're not there first for me, I will be there. You're worried that you're going to be alone, but no, I will be there. Family love in the church, it's a high calling. It's a quiet ministry, though, isn't it? It's a, it's a part of a quiet life. It's the kind of stuff that always, almost always happens behind the, scene, behind the scenes. But it's a powerful thing to treat someone like family, to be treated like family when you're not blood relatives. Some of you ex have experienced this. Um, for some longer season after, after college, when I was living uh, far from home, I, I experienced some of this from, from people in the church. And, when you, when you get a taste of it, it, you, you, it means even more than almost family love does, you know, because, because it's from people you wouldn't expect it, from people who don't have to, isn't it? 
Now, so this is the question they're asking. Paul, can you help us learn to love? And he, he actually doesn't really answer them. Uh, he responds with an encouraging word. He says, you actually don't need me to teach you about this. Because anyone who gets close to you knows that God's taught you how to do this already. And here he, I think he models for us what it means to be encouraging present and encouraging presence for each other. Uh, because have you, have you heard people uh, encourage you that way too? I know you're worried about this. I know you're worried about being a bad mom or, or that you feel like you're always a failure at work, but I see you and you're doing a great job. Keep up the good work. Those things can, when, when, the, when it's an honest word, it can really hit us hard because, and the reason, part of the reason is that so many jobs are so thankless. I and mean, we're talking about parenting so we can stay there for a second. I mean, um, at least when the kids are little, they don't ever open the, the door and say, oh my goodness, all these clean socks, you did this for me, you know, right? It's just an assumption, like, my world means clean socks here, right? Like, I need food now, get it for me, right? Um, or, or thank you so much for being so patient, I saw it in my dad, I really, I saw that you were so irritated, but you really held it back, you did a great job, you know, you were so patient, and no, they never thank you, right? It, it's at least not their... Not at those stages, right? It's, it's thankless work, but it's very important. Um, but it's not just families that experience this, right? If you're at work uh, or, or you're someone who's in school, right? They, you know, how, how often does your job say, wow, thanks so much for listening to people complain at you all day, right? So that I don't have to listen to it. Or if you're in school, wow, thanks so much for staying up all night to write this paper. It's so much easier to read and grade now that you try it. These, again, these are not things that they are just part of life. We often go a fair amount of time putting out energy, putting out effort, with very minimal affirmation and feedback. And so when you do get a genuine word, a, a, a real thank you, it can be rare, but it's really precious. And so, of course, here Paul models it for us. You're doing a great job. Keep up the good work. And so I think someone I think probably needs to hear this, if not everyone that uh, you're giving and you're giving and you're giving and it's almost all happening behind the scenes and it is very thankless but you need to know that God hears God sees and he sees it as a beautiful thing because it's the church being like family it's serving in these quiet ways behind the scenes so uh, if, you're, if you're pursuing this, this quiet life it means you're, you're loving in ways that are um, that are uh, you know, you're speaking these encouraging words. Um, you're, you're present with each other in a way that almost looks like family to people who are outside. Like, why would you do so much for that with those people? But there's another one, and it's in verse 11, and I'll just quote it directly. It says, mind your business. And um, it means don't stir up trouble, right? Uh, don't, don't take an unhealthy interest in bad news. You don't dig in and enjoy this kind of thing. You especially don't stir it up. Um, now, this doesn't mean, of course, that you stick your head in the sand uh, and try to, or that you try to be ignorant of bad things that are happening. Uh, but here's the balance that we're going for. Uh, we do need to hear ugly things sometimes when we're moving toward each other and trying to be an encouragement to each other, trying to be present in each other's lives. But on the other hand, when we aspire to live a quiet life, uh, minding our own business, that, that means that when we do press in, um, we honor it as a privilege to be let in. Um, we, we treat it as, as precious uh, material. It's almost like someone served you with the fine china, right? Is that they put you in a position of honor by sharing this information or by, or you came upon it, you, you learned something that uh, was, was very personal to a person, but you, you treat it with honor as a valuable thing. And so you hear it, you treat it carefully as something of high value that the person did not have to share with you. So it's very, very far from meddling You've engaged people in a respectful way when you do engage. That is a quiet life of love. And we'll dig in on this meddling thing in a minute here as we do the last part, which is how we work. So I wonder who, who you think needs to be told to mind the business. Now, this is when I used to work at Philadelphia School District. This would be a common phrase if someone like pried into someone else's business. They'd mind your business, and it'd be like everyone jump in together in the class. Mind your business, quit asking those questions. Uh, it, it always came off with an edge, right? Uh, but here, I want you to hear it with love. And I focus on what's yours to do. Someone who is uh, writing about these verses said that if you're restless on the inside, then it's easy for you to be idle and meddlesome on the outside. If you're restless on the inside, you end up doing restless and meddling things on the outside. 
If you're not quiet inside, then on the outside it's much harder to do the work that you're actually supposed to be doing. And so you end up doing things that aren't productive and that are kind of meddling. And I'm sure the Thessalonians had their own version of this, but I mean, here I picture for us, you're at work, but you're arguing with your relatives on Facebook, you know, and you are getting yourself all worked up, but you're not getting much work done. And, you know, these verses, of course, are a lot more about, a lot, about a lot more than just unproductive arguments. Um, but that is a piece of it, that you don't meddle, in, you know, as, as the proverb says that, you know, the one who meddles in a fight that's not his own is like a guy who goes out and takes a dog by the ears, right? It's, it's a, uh, you know, there, there is, there's something damaging and, and unhelpful here that's in view, but there's more than that. And there's this very practical advice for them to hear at this point in time. Because from a few other places in this book, you hear that they were suffering. Uh, chapter 2, 14, you suffered persecution from your own countrymen. Uh, they needed practical advice, and it's as though Paul is saying, Listen, keep a low profile. We're not out here looking for persecution. Just focus on your work, do a good job, and uh, you know, stay out of trouble. And so they, they needed something that would uh, get them through a very precarious time. But it's advice that's been preserved for us for a reason, too. Is that it, that it matters. For, there, there's something here for us. And so I want to zero in on that phrase, make an ambition, your ambition to lead a quiet life. Because it's a, it's a tricky phrase. It's kind of an oxymoron. It's a paradox. It's almost like saying, exert yourself for a rest. Or fight really hard to be peaceful. The, the word it has this sense of energetic action. So it's like giving energetic action to our quietness. And what does quietness even mean then if it's something you can you know, amp yourself all up to do? Uh, but quiet, quietness here can mean withdrawing. So, you know, you're getting to the countryside, you're pulling away from the life of the city and the politics and markets. But it can also mean that, you know, you're kind of bringing the countryside here, right? You're, you're being peaceful on the inside. And some of the early church fathers talked about this a little bit like a both and. So that you kind of need, you want to have a spirit that's calmed as just as uh, detached almost from things as the monk who's in, in the, you know, the monastery praying and being able to focus only on God. But then you also want to be in the mess of life there in the city, too. And you kind of need to have both. And uh, so the people addressed, the, who this kind of vision is addressed to, are people that, although they were facing different circumstances, of course, are very much like us, because they were at times caught doing the things that they were not supposed to be doing, uh, meddling. And they were then absent from doing the things that they were actually supposed to be doing, like work. And... Um, for my uh, little kids, of course, this looks one way. For them, it's like I tell them to go, uh, go get ready for bed, and like they come out yelling and screaming with diapers on their heads, uh, which is what happened recently. Uh, actively doing the thing they were not supposed to be doing, and not engaged in the thing that they were supposed to be doing. But when we're grown up, we do that too. Or at least I don't put diaper on my head, but you do, you do things like that, right? Is that uh, you, you find yourself, I've got something I need to be doing, but I'm doing the absolute opposite thing. It's that feeling like you're, at the, you're standing in front of the refrigerator. You're not even hungry. But you're, there's something stressful that probably needs to get done, and you really don't want to do it. And so you're, you're, you're there at the refrigerator trying to avoid the thing that has to be done. Uh, other struggles work like this, too. Um, most of the people that I work with who are struggling with pornography often struggle the worst when they're feeling really unproductive or really bored or really there's something really high pressure that needs to happen but they can't bring themselves to do it and so they're engaged in something else that, that is obviously not moving them anywhere near the goal. But I wonder where you see your life becoming noisy on the inside or the outside. Where you find yourself in trouble or, or in conflict uh, or an addictive problem because of what you're avoiding. What do you think it will look like for you to live quietly in how you love and how you work? When I run into questions like this, uh, one, of my, one of the things I find most helpful is to look at the life of Jesus. And you stop and you say, well, did he, live, did he live a quiet life? And on the surface, you might say, well, certain things that make you say, like, no, absolutely not, because uh, he is the person who's teaching to these massive crowds, right? They can't happen quietly. Uh, he's the one who walks into, who rides into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. He's the one who runs into trouble with political leaders, uh, who saw him as the meddler, didn't they? Uh, they saw him as a person who's stirring the pot. Uh, him as someone who's creating unrest. 
And so for him coming to die for us, for our sins, meant that he had to be treated like a meddler because of our meddling, uh, as a noisy person because of our noise, as a troublemaker because of the trouble that we make. He refused rest for himself, right, because, um, to, to bring a, because he wanted to bring us to rest. And so we get to invite, we get invited in, he gets to, he experience, we get to experience some of that rest and quietness even in the here and now, even though it's kind of this promised rest to come one day that he's purchased for us. But he says to make it our mission to go after it too. And I love the balance that we see in the life of Jesus because, yes, although there are certain parts of his life that look quite loud, I wonder if you've noticed how many times he's trying to get away to a small group or just a couple friends. Or how many times he's trying to get away to the mountain to be by himself to pray. And he keeps getting interrupted, doesn't he? People always jump in with a need. And he responds graciously and sacrificially. It costs him time. It keeps him from his rest. Uh, but you see him moving life and arranging life toward these quiet times. And I think we would do well to follow his example. We aim toward rest, and then when we're interrupted, we try to offer grace. What's the outcome of all this? Two quick things. If you actually follow this vision that Jesus has purchased for us, and then he says, and I'll go hard after it. I've, I've done this. I was treated as the meddler for your meddling. I was treated as the unquiet for your, or as the, the one who was disquieted as, you know, on behalf of your, your noise. So now run after it. What is it going to happen if we do that? Well, verse 12, you get the right kind of independence. You've launched as a Christian and as an adult. You're financially independent to some degree. You're actually moving forward in life. You don't have to lean on other people in the same way. But the second thing is respect for, uh, you win the respect of outsiders. And what, what this, you get the sense of what this means is that, that the right kind of a quiet life is actually evangelistic. And if I told you about someone, someone I thought was a good evangelist, my guess is you would not expect a quiet person. But I want you to hear this, that maybe we don't, although we, that our expectations might be the opposite, the person who's working faithfully, who's simply walking through life loving the people nearby, always ready to give an answer for the hope that lies within, or as Micah says, loving justice, doing, doing justice, loving mercy, and walking humbly with our God, that's the person who's evangelistic in the right sense. The God who came as a little baby to save the world we know can do really, really big things through really, really small things. Very loud and powerful things through a very quiet life. Let's pray toward this together. Please. Our Father, we thank you for, for holding this way out for us of quietness. We entrust ourselves to you, those who experience unrest. Lord, give us your Sabbath, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand to sing, All I Have is Christ.
Go now in peace. Amen.